sapientia. Que exorde altissimi prodisti, attingens a fine usque ad finem, fortitens suavite disponens qui omnia. Veni, adotem dum nos, viam prudentie. O wisdom, coming forth from the mouth of the Most High, reaching from one end to the other, mightily and sweetly ordering all things. Come and teach us the path of knowledge. Please remain standing and let's put this uh, Advent confession before God. Lord, your season comes, your fire, your shout across our lonely night. But we are not ready. We are in a winter of fears. Caught up in the safe and comfortable, we may miss the burning, avoid the vision, be deaf to the songs. Like autumn leaves, we fade, wither, and fall, and our timidness, like the wind, sweeps us away. But now, in this Advent, we pray for your Spirit. Once more in us, may your weather freshen and blow. Restore us, O Lord, of the coming day. Let your face shine on us, that we may see in the shadows. The mitten trees are up. You are most welcome to bring your knitted gifts of scarves, hats, socks, mittens and gloves into the sanctuary this week and next Sunday and hang them on the mitten trees, which are at the bottom of the stairs here near the piano. Uh, please do not climb the stairs and hang them on the decorated tree, and thank you for your gifts. 
In addition, the property committee, with help from their wives, is looking after Sherwood Park United Church's White Gifts project for Bissell Centre. White Gifts Sunday is next Sunday already, December 5th. We will operate it like last year. Gifts will be offloaded directly from your vehicles into ours. Only gift cards, cash and checks will be brought into the sanctuary and we will even try to intercept them in the parking lot. This way, your gifts will be handled just once, keeping the packaging intact and in good condition for giving. Uh, thank you everyone for participating in this important initiative, helping Bissell Centre help our inner city neighbours. Also, I am asking Joanne to email Bissell's wish list to everyone on Monday morning to assist you in case you are going shopping. Uh, gift cards are also very well received and if you are concerned about addictions, um, remember that Walmart um, does not sell liquor, so um, it is a good option if you are thinking that way. Thank you. Anything else this morning? Remember in previous years, there would be a lineup here all the way down the hall for Advent. <laughs> we'll get there eventually. We'll get there eventually. Um, anything else? Any celebrations today? Other than, that's pretty good right there. Yeah, yeah Marion. Festival singers. All right. Thank you, Marion. Anything else? Okay. All right. Well, um, just a short liturgical note uh, before we hear the choir for the first time in 89 weeks. I actually did the math. 89 weeks or 20, 20 months and what a difference they will make. It feels a lot more normal here now, even though you all are sitting there. Uh, not quite socially distanced, but the best we could do. <laughs> but speaking of singing, um, what was it that I was trying to croak out there in my pandemic voice at the beginning of the service? Um, that was an Advent antiphon, uh, the first of uh, seven, dating from the ninth century. And uh, still sung in Latin today in uh, liturgical churches, probably being sung around the city in some places. Uh, they all begin with O and a title for the Messiah, the great O antiphons. And they end with Veni, come, O oh, come. So uh, what Terry read as she lit the candle is an exact English translation of the Latin. Um, and I guess the, the reason I'm attempting ancient plain song uh, is just to remind us that everything we do in modern church world uh, or anything in the world that we're living now is based on something from the past. Everything stands on something else. And, uh, you know, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is based directly on these O antiphons. Um, you know, something powerful, something important from centuries ago is uh, never really goes away, but we build upon it. We've simply modernized it. And uh, maybe we'll hear a couple more uh, next in the next couple Sundays if, if I can actually sing. Um, and uh, maybe the other reason that I'm daring to sing so raspily in Latin that is, uh, you know, this is my last go around. Through the, through the church seasons, after almost 40 Advents and 40 Christmases and uh, Lents and Easter's, and uh, in front of a congregation, I'll retire five months from now. So I've told uh, Heather and Terry that uh, maybe I'll pull out some stuff I've always wanted to do, uh, just to see how it goes. <laughs> Mixed results so far. <laughs> So at uh, 10 in the morning on uh, May 1st, 
in the year of our Lord 2022, which is a Sunday, I'll walk out in the parking lot of the condo between the beehives there that we just bought. And I'll look into the sky and I'll say, so, so what now, Lord? What would you like me to do now, if anything? Make podcasts, record some YouTubes, learn to play the cello, you know, or better yet, hurry hard and learn to curl. I think that's probably what I need to do. Anyway, thank you all for this opportunity to serve you for these past five years, and now for this sweet five-month extension uh, to my five-year appointment, and uh, so that we can go through these seasons together, and uh, we'll pull out some, uh, some cool things. So let's sing uh, People Look East, and then we will hear the choir for the first time in almost two years. Stay seated for this. All right, how do you sound? <laughs> all right, all right, yeah. <laughs> That's what we were looking for, thank you. <laughs> well, let us pray. Oh, beloved, if we really listen, really listen, we could hear the voice of every planet and animal, every world, every sun and galaxy singing your name. And when we hear it, these precious ones singing your name, we realize it's even more than that. It's the very sound of our souls waking up again. Amen. Well, it is uh, Advent in the year of our Lord 2021, which doesn't even sound like a thing. Uh, it's good to have a season to sort of re-anchor our sense of time since it's been free-floating in pandemic world for so long. I mean, Advent uh, means a lot of things, uh, and we'll get to some of those in a minute, but what it means to me, or what it meant to me, I would say, about 45 years ago, was uh, the brand of my first hi-fi loudspeaker. I was living uh, in a first job out of grad school level poverty in New York City at the time. And uh, the first thing I did when I scraped up a bit of uh, disposable income was to uh, buy a turntable, an amp, and a sweet set of Advent speakers. Anybody, anybody have those? Advent speakers? They, they, were, they were a big deal in the 70s. If you had them, you'd remember, and you'd go, yeah, yeah, I had those. Oh, all right, all right. <laughs> so I've, I've had aspirations of uh, becoming an audiophile ever since I was a teenager, and I rather bravely came out as a uh, classical music fan in the city that thinks in invented rock and roll. Not jazz, not R&B, not Motown, not bluegrass, but rock and roll, a city in which a young person around 1965 was to be able cogently to compare and contrast Paul Revere and the Raiders and the English Invasion Band like the Kinks. And if you could stomach the string quartet in the background of some of their songs, the very disliked Beatles. <laughs> These are the conversations that you had. You had to be able to converse. But while my buddies were hanging out at the Battle of the Bands at the community center, I wanted to hang out at Severance Hall, the home of the best band in the land, the Cleveland Orchestra. The problem was you had to dress up to go there, and you know, I didn't care much for that nonsense. Uh, I, I saw no reason why you couldn't wear the same thing at an orchestra concert that you could at a rock concert. I, I had the same argument with my parents every Sunday morning. I still, you know, oh, come on now. But uh, because you, you had to dress up to go there, and it costs some money, more than the usual rock concert, that's why electronic reproduction of recorded sound became so important to me in high school. 
A guy could kick, kick back in the dank basement, uh, you know, with, a, with an old salvage record player, you know, the kind with the tinny speaker that was built in. It was all one box. That uh, just sounded awful, but we didn't know that then. And you could put on the records of Bach and Handel and Brahms, Stravinsky, Benjamin Britten, Alan Hovannis, and nobody would be the wiser. Nobody would have to know what I was doing down there. So as I said, I bought my first stereo system when I was 23, living in New York City. And it was so hard to part with some of those 25-year-old components, uh, you know, after a while when you could play music with the CD drive out of the computer uh, on iTunes and sound came out of the tinny little speakers that came with the computer. My lovely advents, you couldn't hook them up to the computer. So in they went to a storage room. But the technology changed so much after those late 90s and early 2000s that by say 2015, my old stuff just didn't cut it anymore. And when those old computer speakers began to snap, crackle, and pop, I thought I would just look into some new gear before applying to come to Canada so I'd have a fresh sonic start up here where the air is clear and cold. <laughs> well, just a quick look on the internet will uh, tell you that being a serious audiophile, having fresh new gear, is as expensive a hobby as Formula One race cars or, you know, J-class yachting or a Olympic dressage. It's a not-in-this-lifetime kind of hobby for, for most people. But like anybody, you know, I wanted to dream. I can dream, can't I? So not long before packing to come here, this is... Uh, probably in, in 2016, I happened to be visiting my sister in Seattle. And I nonchalantly snuck into one of those snobby high-end audio stores with the listening rooms. You've, you've been in these things? Oh my gosh, they're nice. So when I told the hipster dude that greeted me that I was considering a real hi-fi system, maybe centered on my old Advent loudspeakers that I still had packed away in a storage bin. He looked at me first with pity <laughs> and then disdain. And he said, Advent went bankrupt, bankrupt in 1981, you know. Oh, really? I said, I, I did not know that. <laughs> But after we chatted briefly, he took me into one, one of these plushly furnished rooms filled with speakers of all shapes and sizes and an Apple Macintosh computer like the one I had just gotten at home. And he sat me down, pushed a switch, and it queued up a, I don't know, vaguely Schubertian orchestral cut on iTunes, and he said, listen to this. And the sound came out of some small speakers that looked very much like the little computer speakers I had at home. And I could hear the music well, you know, the highs, the, the lows, the timpani, the what have you. But I was secretly a little disappointed with this for such an expensive place. It sounded like the orchestra was squeezed into those two little boxes. A hundred tiny musicians playing their teeny little hearts out. In, in boxes that size. And I said, oh, not too bad. I told the hipster, uh, you know, okay. Trying to play it cool since I was 30 years older than he was. He said, those are desktop computers a whole generation newer than what you have at home. And what you heard was an MP3 file run through the computer sound card to these little speakers. And, the, you know, the Mac has a pretty decent integrated sound card. Uh-huh, uh-huh, I said, yeah, uh-huh. Well, that's pretty much what you're used to hearing, isn't it? And I had to agree that, yeah, it's in fact a little better than what I was used to hearing. Now, the guy in the heavily rimmed glasses said, let's take that same music file, 
bypass the Mac sound card completely and run it with a USB cable through these active powered speakers which have an external DAC. Uh, 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 what, uh, uh, what now? A DAC, a digital to analog converter. Okay, I said, as he switched to another set of computer speakers, a bit more square, slightly bigger than the others, uh, Bowers and Wilkins MM1s if you're keeping score. And when the music first came on, I don't know what my outward reaction was, but suddenly the entire symphony orchestra was arrayed in front of me and all around me. I could practically see them. So present was that unnamed orchestra. And the music, the music went in me and through me, in front, in back, on the sides. So present and real it was. He could tell that I was mesmerized with this. He said, if you like that, he said, that's just the beginning. He started to show me amps and preamps, ribbon tweeters and silk dome woofers, electrostatic planar headphones, 1.5 systems. It's kind of like audio porn, actually. And oh my gosh, I was dizzy. Price was never mentioned. <laughs> you can go as far as you want, he said. The music can be as close to you as your own heartbeat. He called after me as I staggered out the store. But that's true with anything worthwhile, isn't it? Anything worthwhile at all. You can take your hobby, your craft, your to stratospheric levels in terms of time and money, but also sheer joy. I mean, I've, some, some, I've seen some pretty wonderful wood shops that you all have and kitchens and sewing rooms that are way past entry level. And it's true, of course, in the realm of spirituality as well. You can go as far as you want, counting both the cost and the joy of it. <clears throat> and the presence of God can seem as close as your own heartbeat. So if we follow the Advent way, the Advent way, the way that didn't go bankrupt in 1981, we can perceive the presence of God as fully as the music from that second pair of speakers and far beyond that. But like that external DAC that bypasses the computer sound card, we have to bypass the conventional way of doing things, the conventional way of thinking about things, and the conventional way of feeling our way through things. This Advent way, this wisdom way that we're going to develop in the next couple of weeks. This wisdom way was just shouted out by the Hebrew prophets, especially when the tribes of Judah and Benjamin were exiled in Babylon. And again, when they returned to Jerusalem after the king of Persia got them the, released. It's the central event in the Old Testament. Not the escape from Egypt and the parting of the waters and all that. No, it's the exile in Babylon. So a few years after these Jewish exiles returned from Babylon and began to rebuild the temple, the Samaritans, descendants of the other ten tribes of Israel, were making a move to establish their temple as the true one, and Samaritans disrupted the Jerusalem temple's construction. That's a whole long story, pretty interesting, but kind of long. And so work on the Jerusalem temple stopped for a time. The Jewish planners and builders withdrew from the unfinished temple and they put their time and effort into building their own houses. The restored Jerusalem culture stalled and went back into exile mode. And people distanced themselves from the restoration process, distanced themselves from each other, and as the prophet tells it, distanced themselves from God. So the prophet Haggai, not a household name, but it's in there. The prophet Haggai, whose name in Hebrew means appropriately for the season, my festival, my holiday. Haggai, 
let the self-preserving people know how God felt about that. And uh, Karen has that for us. Then Yahweh's words by Hagar, the prophet, saying, Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies wasted? Think. Take stock. What do you really want? You have sown much seeds, but harvested little. You eat, but you're still hungry. You drink, but you're still thirsty. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm, and your wages run out through the holes in your pockets. You have had great ambitions for yourselves, but little has come of it. What you have brought home, I have blown away. And why, said the Lord of hosts, because while you have worked hard for yourselves, caught up with caring for your houses, my home is in ruins. Mm -mm. The Bible's never irrelevant. <laughs> Some things are always true whether in ancient Judah or in modern North America, when the setter starts to wobble, it's pretty sure bet that what's lacking isn't means, isn't money or material, but spiritual depth. What's missing is a collective vision rich and sustaining enough to bypass the self-preservation instinct, bypass the way things have been done, and step into the divine presence. Think. Take stock. What do you really want? Haggai bellows, and that's the wisdom question. That's the holy wisdom question. It's a question all of Western culture needs to ask itself, and in a very big hurry. Who are we again? And what are we doing with our riches and our resources, our advantages and our expertise? What are we doing? So the Advent way, the way of wisdom, takes all that we do and say and think and tries to shape it into a more universal and subtle understanding of human purpose. It requires the whole of our being, our walking being, our sleeping being, our serious and silly being, our self-centered being, Wisdom, un unlike church and religion and conventional spirituality, can't be bypassed. It's always been there. It's always been there. It can't be compartmentalized. The Advent way, and recall that the word Advent means approaching. Approaching. The Advent way is transrational, mystical, unified way of knowing. That's possible for absolutely anybody. It bypasses the usual categories of rational human thought. It sees beyond the assorted random pieces that the world and human culture seem to be on the surface with all of our nation states and all of our corporations and all of our tribes. The underlying coherence beneath the surface chaos can be known, say the prophets, say the mystics. We're still reading the Hebrew prophets 2,500 years later. We're still reading the likes of the Persian poets like Rumi and Hafiz. We're still buying those books. So say the 13 indigenous grandmothers whose counsel is sought the world over. And so says the wisdom master, Jesus, around whose birth this whole Haggai, this whole uh, festive holiday, is, uh, is pivoting. So the ancient way is still with us, waiting to be reborn. Or more accurately and more dramatically, I think, uh, less dramatically, uh, waiting to be noticed. Holy wisdom is here, always has been. All we have to do is notice it. As a Sufi wisdom teacher put it fairly recently, not ancient at all, he said, we are knee deep in a river 
searching for water. Wisdom isn't hidden from sight. Its clues are scattered liberally throughout the whole sacred tradition. We just have to notice them. So that's what we'll do in this somewhat restricted in-person Advent season. Uh, we'll notice the clues strewn around Scripture, flung all through the tradition. And once again, we'll step in to the astonishing presence of God in us, through us, around us, above us, on the side of us, in back of us. We'll step into what God does and what God says. Amen? Let's call ourselves to prayer. God is with us. Let us lift our hearts in prayer. Let us center ourselves for prayer. Show us, O oh God of the Advent, how to kindle an adventurous season in this only slightly less dangerous year. Show us how to be open-eyed and alive to your realm in our midst. Keep us excited like little kids on Christmas Eve about being co-creators with you. 21 years into the 21st century. New decisions, new thoughts, new possibilities, new ways of organizing ourselves. May we in our varied places, some frantic, some chill, some depressed, may we gain new glimpses of what might be. In this season of generosity and commitment, may we be filled with the challenge and possibility of enfleshing kindness, even in this ongoing pandemic. We draw upon your life-giving Holy Spirit energy as we take care of ourselves in this congregation of people. May we care about laughing and crying and learning and talking honestly, at least a little. We commit our caring for those who are recovering, those who are gaining in strength, and with those whose physical strength ebbs away, and all others coping with and adjusting to this worldwide strain and stress. May we create Advent and Christmas peace, even in the midst of conflict and clash. 
May we move beyond our hurtful tendencies, our petty grievances, our passivity and selfishness. Let us be aware of the beauty and the violence we share. And may we strive for love-filled encounters that bring about sweetness and grace and spiritual power. Just as the Advent Antiphon talked about, you're coming with mightily and sweetly. With the energy in this place and with the honest inquiry and intellectual freedom, may there be great care for the things that would make it better and easier to live together in this troubled world. May we care about the hard decisions and the risks and sacrifices it takes to make this happen. In this congregation, may holy wisdom be manifest among us in ways that we didn't expect and didn't know about before. May we care about the joy we feel, which flickers and flares at times when we touch our eyes or elbows or fists or minds or souls. May we tend to those things that make us restless, make us reach for welcoming words, for dreams, for others. May this community take on new talents, new commitments, new values, new kinds of care, new missions, new ways of organizing itself. May this community be safe and secure. May it be just a little risky in terms of new ideas and forms of worship. We pray in honor of what is possible, what's beautiful, what's essential and honest. We pray for all of those wrestling with addictions, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual addictions. We pray for those recovering from COVID, those whose surgeries have been set aside because of COVID. And we lift them up before you and your perfect health. And all of this is summed up in Jesus' simple prayer, which in Old English goes like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever and ever. Amen. So our benediction this morning is from one of the books of the Apocrypha found between the Old and the New Testaments in most Bibles. And this is from the Book of Wisdom, uh, written just a few years before Jesus was born, uh, in the advent of the Christian centuries, we might say. And uh, we'll hear this uh, today and for the next couple Sundays till it's sort of in our head. For wisdom is quicker to move than any motion. She is the breath of the power of God. Wisdom is the reflection of the eternal light. And the true image of divine love. Oh, keep that in mind over the week. Um, We'll see you next Sunday, and someday we'll be able to go downstairs and drink coffee again. Just not today.